Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in today to our class all about carnivorous plants. Um, intended again for all ages today. We really um, love to dive deep into the science of this particular group of plants. And there's a lot of interesting facts to talk about. So I have the joyful pleasure today to be uh, joined by my good friend, Patrick Urbanski, um, who, as you may see, we'll post a photo in the links to the, in the comments here. We'll post our handout as we normally do, um, but I'm also gonna post a photograph of the very first class I taught with Patrick years ago now when he was just about 12 or maybe 13 years old. Um, so Patrick really has been um, key in uh, growing for me, pun intended, of course, growing my love of carnivorous plants um, and has taught me a ton about them as, as I've learned um, and grown things. So uh, without further ado, uh, Patrick, I want you first off to just tell us like what, what's, what's the background of these guys? What, what's their deal? Yeah. Well, carnivorous plants, they're native to almost every continent in the world except Antarctica. Um, there's a, quite a few actually that are native to the United States, including a lot of our Saracenia, um, a lot of our flytraps are only native to North Carolina actually. Um, and then there's also a lot of tropical plants that are native um, to Asia and um, other places around there. Um, they, um, the sundew right there, um, very, very full. Um, one of the easiest carnivorous plants that you can grow to. It's got a bonus fern yeah. uh, hanging out. So because, and you can see a little bit as we handle these plants, they may drip water. Um, so they're bog loving plants as we'll get back into, but they've just come out of like trays of water, um, which ferns don't seem to mind either as many of us know. So sundew. Sorry. Hey, no, you're fine. It might, you might be surprised to know too that there are actually a few carnivorous plants native to Oregon. Um, there's a few species of sundew that are, they're tiny sundews, they're very little. Um, and there's also the wonderful um, Darlingtonia or cobra lily, um, native to Oregon and Northern California. Um, they're very difficult for a lot of people to grow because they're, um, they night the really cold water running through them, which is really good here for us. So it's a lot easier for us to grow them. You can see the light shining through. Can you see that through the camera? Yes. What's yeah. that all about, Patrick? Well, in the top of those um, hoods there is what they're called. Um, there's windows in them, and so once the bug goes in through the hole that's kind of underneath that mustache that Nicole pointed out to you, um, the windows up top kind of confuse the insect that gets inside, uh, thinking that it's ways out. Um, and as it struggles, it gets farther and farther down into the trap um, until it can no longer get out. So these windows do not open. They're really just like clear, see-through panels inside the or you know as part of the plant <clears throat> and if i blocked it with light of course you wouldn't be able to see through those panels as well <clears throat> but what is the what's the mustache for do you know the purpose of the i'm not sure actually the purpose of the mustache i think it um also i think it releases um some nectar some attractant um like the sorry thing i do kind of on the back of their pictures here right um to they, mm -hmm. they waft like a, mm -hmm. a smell yeah do we smell it not normally no. Unless you're more bug-like. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's also, sometimes they contain, like in um, tropical pitcher plants, actually, they'll contain a drug that will make the bug actually um, kind of loopy before they fall in, so it's nice. harder for them to get away. Does so. it also make them maybe more likely to go to it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. like a bar? Everybody sure. flocks to the bar, yeah. right? Um, so the opening on this, what this is the Darlingtonia, mm -hmm. um, or cobra lily. So the opening on the cobra lily is actually up underneath this big hood. Um, so it's kind of like a reverse, like, you know, like uh, Sherlock Holmes <laughs> pipe, right? Uh, without the without the mustache, and that's probably not the official name, but without the mustache, <laughs> you can see the hole there, and it does. It's shaped just like a little pipe. Um, but the hole also, and the arrangement of it on all of these pictures, like, has aerodynamic mm -hmm. aspects. Yes, for sure, yeah. We'll get more into that later when we talk about the trapping method. So cool. But yeah, and so that's always really fun because there's a, actually a park that you can go down to if you're ever in Florence called Darlingtonia Wayside. Um, and it's just a few boardwalks through this bog, this sphagnum bog that you can walk through and these are just growing wild in there. And it's very awesome. Pretty tall. Like they, get, they can get a few feet tall. Yeah, two, up three, to three feet tall. tall. Mm -hmm. So yeah. now um, the cobra lilies are a little bit more advanced, right? Yeah, they're a little bit more for the experienced grower. Again, it's not as hard for us because they're native to here. 
Um, so it's a little hotter down in the valley. They're not as native here, but they're um, they're pretty. They're a little easier for us here in Oregon, at least, to grow. Well, not, yeah. So Patrick set up to make them really happy. Um, he's got a really great ingenious <laughs> setup um, where he's just got a very small, um, like a tabletop fountain pump that runs from a lower water reservoir and actually circulates running water or fresh running water through his potted container of cobra lilies, which mimics their... Yeah, they really like growing along um, um, like slow moving streams or in cooler um, bogs that like the soil keeps cooler so that running water really helps keep the soil cool. And that's really the secret to growing that specific plant is keeping those cool roots. So smart, so smart. But there's another Native American native North American carnivorous plant. Yeah. That's probably the most popular of all yeah. carnivorous Everyone plants. Everyone knows, I think. Everyone knows. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the Venus flytrap, uh, right here, that one is a lower growing, so it's going to stay more compact, actually, with bigger traps. There is literally um, a fly in there. Uh, <laughs> not a very good lighting, is it? Much better. Much better. Yeah. So yeah, at least one good meal that this plant's had, and there's probably one in there with the, the mouth closed. And so those guys are actually only native to North um, Carolina, and there's a park that they're protected by law. It's illegal to go and remove them from their natural habitat. Um, but they're no, they're not native to anywhere else in the world, which is a common misconception. A lot of people think that they're tropical plants. They get the, all the cold weather up in North Carolina. They get the snow and they get the hot sun too. So what's the saddest thing that happens to most people's Venus flytrap? A lot of times people will keep them inside, yeah. um, kind of in a dark room. Hard to blame, yeah, you yeah, want to watch it. Mm -hmm, for sure, but they really do best um, outside um, in the full sun, and they like the cold winter rest too, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Can I poke at it? Sure. Is it okay? Does, yeah. it, does it hurt it? It does. If you, like, you can do it once, and then you would want to leave it alone after that. Um, it can waste a lot of energy that the plant, because it takes a lot of energy for the plant to close the trap. So, I mean, if you want to do it once every so often, if that's okay, but you don't want to keep doing it because it'll, it's wasting energy and it's not getting anything back. Nothing you're not to catching it. Yeah, no reward. Mm -hmm. I'll hold off until we can maybe show it as we talk about what yeah, it is. Yeah, for sure. Yes. Um, so I think we should move on maybe to some of the tracking, yeah. tracking mechanisms. how these things really work. Yeah. So, so we talked a little bit. Yeah, right. we can talk about that one. That one's actually called the lobster pot style trap because it catches more of the bugs and in, not instead of just kind of going in and you're trapped, it kind of confuses them a little bit before and they get farther and farther down in the pitcher. Um, <clears throat> now these are both like pitcher style. Yeah, they're very similar. That one is um, also known as the pitfall trap too, um, the sarsenia right there. Um, the bug will get up on the top of the edge there. It's very slippery for the bug. It's, I mean, if you felt it too, it's pretty slick. Um, and on the kind of the back and underside of that hood that she was showing you there, um, it'll produce a nectar that actually attracts um, flies and wasps and other stuff like that. Um, and as they absorb the nectar, they look farther and farther down in the pitcher where they find some usually downward facing hairs actually so that prevents them from backing up or crawling back out. And as they get farther and farther down, there is no airlift actually, which is the aerodynamic piece of it. Yes. And bugs cannot fly out of there. Um, and so that's how they end up getting trapped um, in the pitcher plant and the cobra lily. So it's like so many devious mechanisms mm -hmm. all kind of converging in one. Yeah, there's a lots of different aspects to it that they're um, really keeping these bugs in or bringing them in to get caught. And in some cases, even drugging them. Yeah. So that they all their defenses are lessened. I mean, that's just yeah, like Especially borderline with, sinister. Mm -hmm. For sure. Um, Nicole's gonna cut open this cobra lily pitcher for you guys to look inside. It's got a little what we call indigestion, carnivorous plant indigestion. Yeah, here's um, the dark spot here. Lots of nutrients, um, and they are causing some dark spots. And as the plant kind of ages or fills up, it'll um, kind of almost kind of rot a little bit just because there's so many nutrients that the bug is caught, or that the plant has caught. Um, being dissolved from the bugs. Okay, Patrick is not as gross or willing to maybe go as gross as I am. He's saying that there are so many nutrients inside the plant or that it has caught so many nutrients. It has caught so many bugs in its little plant belly here that this pitcher is full up to here on my fingers. So its little belly actually runs all the way down to the base of the stem. It gets skinnier and skinnier 
as the bug falls in here, we already talked about how it's lured in there in the, you know, in the first place. So it is, you know, lured in with candy or the smell of a pretty sexy bug or whatever, you know, different ways that it's lured in. Gets in there and slips and falls. Maybe it's drugged. Gosh knows what else is happening to it. And then it lands into like digestive juices that the plant has created, kind of like our stomach acid, that slowly turns it into bug soup down there. And the bug soup percolates down lower into like the bottom, the small intestine, basically, of the pitcher plant. And by here it's a slurry that is nutrient, like Patrick said, that the plant can now intake as nutrient. But there are some sneaky, like, robbers that will come and like take advantage of the fact that in a plant like this, there is a body pile waiting to be consumed by the plant. And dead bugs that are sitting up top aren't yet even being um, soaked up as bug soup. So frogs sometimes will hide inside of a pitcher plant and get the bug before it dies, you know, nice easy bait. Uh, I've seen lots of spiders take up residence inside of a pitcher plant and again, kind of catch the bugs before the pitcher itself enjoys it. Um, but there, sometimes I hear a little flutter inside and I can tip the plant and even save the life of maybe the moth or the, you know, critter that is still on the top of the body pile. So again, mm -hmm. just Well, even with that process too, it's not like the plant gets nothing too. It's a little gross, but like if there's a frog in the mm -hmm. pitcher and he's catching okay. stuff, he's gonna poop in there too. And that's gonna also feed the plant. The plant really doesn't care. So um, actually in the tropics, there's um, a tropical binding pitcher plant. Um, they're called Nepenthes. There's um, one relationship with a certain plant that this tree shrew has that it will actually tree use. Tree shrew? Mm -hmm. It's like a little a type thing. Yeah, a little rodent kind of thing. Um, they actually will use the pitchers as toilets. Um, oh my gosh. They eat the um, nectar that the pitcher produces, they lick it off the top, and then they um, use them as toilets. And so the plant still does also get um, nutrients from that relationship. It's not like it's being robbed of anything. Looks like Patrick will go a little bit more graphic, <laughs> just with some encouragement, right? All right, and while we're getting gross here, I am doing some major surgery to get in to the inside of this pitcher plant to really show what it's caught. And then we'll move on to the next plant because these guys are just fascinating. Um, now, one of the things, and again, we'll, we will reiterate this as we go along, pitcher... Pitcher plants, Saracenia is the majority of the plants that you see in the background here and what I'm holding. These are quite hardy outdoors in our climate. Um, mine grow in containers, in potted containers, um, outside with minimal winter protection. And they, they, they work like a perennial. So every winter, the kind of old stuff dies back and then by spring, we like trim it down, and every year, then it puts out or grows out new pictures and new plants. And even along the, as the season progresses, um, big game hunters and successful pictures like this one here, this picture isn't even gonna last the whole season on its own. I mean, once it catches a lot of bugs, nutrients, it's gonna sag over, you know, this one and another few, had just they couldn't even hold themselves up anymore. Their bellies are so full. That's kind of a good example too. Yeah, tipping over out kind of like this, and so they're just full, and they lost their ability to stay up, and they um, have indigestion, and they you know they just worn themselves out. So as we look into the inside of this pitcher plant, I just want to remind you that it has only caught these bugs since starting in like late May. Yeah. Yeah, okay, ready? I got my white piece of paper to try to really show. And sometimes little things escape. Okay, here's a really good example of the fact that sometimes, can you see it, Becky? Yes. Sometimes, like that's not dirt and debris. This is decomposed insects um, and decomposing insects. Now there is a bumblebee in the top of my uh, body pile, which is unfortunate. And usually they're not lured. I mean, it's not that the attractant that's put out by the pitcher is usually not 
Yeah. I tried. Yeah, the pitcher can't tell what bug it's catching. Exactly. Yeah. They don't mean to. Um, but so there is a honeybee in here and or a bumblebee. I try to keep my carnivorous plant collection away from a lot of flowering plants or blooming plants, just so that I'm not drawing in a bunch of bees and pollinators only to then accidentally, you know, swallow them up with my carnivorous plants. Yeah, well, I mean, that's a good thing to talk Don't about, too, because serial killer. if you notice, like, on this plant right here, this is actually an old flower that it put out this spring, and a lot of these plants will either shoot up a flower stalk that's way above the traps here, as you can see, um, or it'll open up actually before the pitchers open up so that they still get pollinated because that's a very important part of this plant, of any plant's life cycle is to get pollinated and produce seeds and keep growing. Um, and so you can see kind of on this one right here and there's another one back here with a tall flower stalk that's now they're producing seeds. Um, but they are, it's meant to keep the pollinators safe so that they get pollinated. Just an example, what's coming out? Fly bodies. There's probably some maggots in there. We won't really talk about that, but moths. Fly, lots of flies, wasps. My picture plants catch a lot of wasps. Yeah, me too. So just a taste of what's inside. And where are we at? All right. Uh, yeah, we'll move on to like the snap trap really snap quick. Trap. We already looked at the Venus fly trap earlier, um, but this plant is very intricate trap. It has the um, inside of the um, kind of the lobe of the trap they, on each side they have three little trigger hairs that they um, that a bug will have to touch twice within like 20 or 30 seconds I think is what it is um, for that to actually close which is kind of insane like the plant is thinking uh, or is counting not thinking it's counting it's counting um, how long there is a bug in there so because a trigger hair here yeah trigger hair in here. They're in the inside, not the eyelash parts. The eyelashes do what? The eyelashes kind of, as they close, they come together and it makes it really hard for the bug to get through them um, as it's closing. They it, interlock mm -hmm. like jail bars. Yeah. It's very quick closing too. It's like a third of a second and they close. Okay, um, so I'm going to hit two of the three. One trigger, two triggers. Good thing there's no flies around. <laughs> So and, yeah. Yeah, I and mean, with those guys, they work actually on a hydraulic system. And as the trigger hairs are pushed twice, an electric shock is released, and water flows into the trap, and that's how it closes. Gosh, he just says this so casually. <laughs> I always have to re I have to repeat that. That closure that you just witnessed was done through hydraulics. Do plants have muscles? Can they just go and close their jaws? No, no, they can't. They don't have brains. They can't be counting. They've got to figure out a way to, as Patrick mentioned, have a trigger mechanism that's smart enough to not be accidentally trapped, tripped, right? So like dust particles or right. a bug that's like in and out mm -hmm. really quick and they would never catch it anyways. If they closed, they might even release a little bit of acid. Mm -hmm. They were gonna burn themselves out. Yeah. So the mechanism it's closing with is hydraulics, using water and water pressure and a fast movement of water and the movement is released, the water is released or triggered through an electrical buildup, an electrical signal builds up inside the plant and then trips basically like a little flap or trap door in there that allows water to gush into the, in, the, the mouth portion, which the way that it's folded sort of origami style forces that mouth to trap shut. And even after all of that too, if there is nothing moving inside the trap, it won't keep closing. So once something is moving inside the trap, it closes tighter and tighter um, until it gets to the point where it can digest it. But if there's nothing moving, it's not gonna keep using energy to close. Yeah, so, so actually that's a good point because the one that we tricked is this one here. And it is more loosely closed than the one next to it, which probably has prey in it. And then of course we've got more closed ones as well. That are that must be digesting, and then they get to a point where they like just wear out, right? They yeah. Enough, and After, then they die. Like a few closes, they the trap is kind of spent, and so it'll replace it during the growing season. Um, but this and, one's brand new. Yeah. There's another brand new one being born in that you know. So each trap is what expires, not the whole plant, just the you know, just the map. Yeah. And then another kind of trap we have is kind of the sticky trap or the flypaper trap. Um, this one's more of the sticky trap, it's a sundew. They've got these nice little almost tentacles that come off of their leaves. 
um, that produce like this really sticky, shiny dew that bugs also think is nectar. Um, so once they land on that track there, um, they kind of struggle and they get more and more stuck in the nipple showing it's very sticky. Um, very sticky. Yeah, and then those, that specific sundew can actually move its leaf a little bit and it curls around its prey. Um, you and can then see some curled. Mm -hmm. It'll release the digestive enzymes just directly from the leaf onto the bug there. Uh, and then reabsorb it that way. You don't see it curl though. You never really see it. You can't watch it. Happen. No, you can't watch it. It's very yeah. slow. Yeah. So this is a sundew. Uh, this is a type of sundew called Drosera capensis. capensis. And another. But yeah, that one right there is called Drosera tracei. Um, and that one is a hardy plant, so that's something you keep outside. But there's sundews for indoor and outdoor. Which is great because the outdoor ones, they really will catch flying um, like moths and mosquitoes, which is helpful. Um, and then the Drosser Capensis you can keep in the house, it'll catch house flies and uh, fungus gnats and all those kinds of things. This one catches a ton of those big like crane fly mosquito eater mm -hmm. things. Yeah, Tons of those. yeah, a lot of my, I hope the performance is very similar to that and they also are very, um, they track things like that. Lots of babies in there too. Yeah. And this has a buddy, it has a little Venus fly pack print, so the red one, yeah. they can go together. Yeah, um, and then something that's very similar to that, but it's not as sticky, it goes more specifically after fungus snacks and um, fruit flies, so it's great to have inside your house, especially in that fruit bowl in the summer. Um, they're called butterworts. Um, they look almost like little succulents, um, but a lot of people grow them for their flowers, um, because of, they have all those special little flowers and they're usually kind of a lavender purple color or white kind of somewhere in there. There is one kind that has a red flower and people like that one a lot. Um, Look at the bugs on there. Yeah, and those guys will catch the small flies, fruit, uh, fungus gnats. They really, it's really nice to have in the growing space too because they catch all the fruit gnats if you're having problems. Another, another bloom. Yeah, so as you get like tomatoes sitting on the counter right now, fruit on the, you know, <clears throat> countertop, getting fruit flies in the house. Little butterwort friend here can help to, you know, trap those guys, um, as well as the, the sundews are great as, as, you know, little sticky fly paper. Yeah. Much prettier than a roll of fly trap paper in your house, for yeah. sure. Now that one's this cross, it's called Pingu Gina, uh, which is kind of funny. Gina. Yeah. So. Um, we can talk about yeah. some of the, where, where we would grow some of these Perfect. guys. Yeah, there's a lot of um, different kinds of carnivorous plants, and there's two main ones that we'll split them up through. There's one for indoor, like a group for indoor growing and a group for outdoor growing. Um, a lot of people will want to keep their fly traps inside just because they're so cool, but we really suggest it's possible to keep them outside all year um, with full sun, and they love to stay moist, like most carnivorous plants do. Um, and so the fly traps will grow alongside the pitcher plants that we have kind of back here and some of the sundews as well. Um, if I had two fly traps and I wanted to keep one inside mm -hmm. and rotate it out. I mean, you could do that, but again, it's the, um, with these hardy plants, they really like that winter chill. Um, so if you were able to provide that somehow inside, you could definitely do that. Um, but they really like to take a break in the winter. They stop growing. With fly traps, they get really small, close to the ground traps. Um, they kind of lose all their outer, bigger traps. And the sarsenia, you kind of just give them a big haircut and they go all the way down to a rhizome that they have there um, until springtime. And they just kind of sit dormant for the winter time and then they will regrow in the spring. So all right. um, it's also hard too sometimes inside to replicate that full sun that they like. They, they can do okay with three to four hours of full sun. They get a little floppy and not as colorful but they really like six hours. Yeah, here's an example of kind of one that hasn't been in full sun. They're a little floppy. There's a lot of those non-carnivorous leaves. The um, flat ones. Mm -hmm, yeah, to get more photosynthesis because it's in a lower light um, oh, area. Yeah. And then um, kind of with like the one that she has there, it's called freckles, Sarsenia freckles. You can see that beautiful like red freckly color on top um, with the kind of the white veins and stuff through it. That will come with um, full sun. They really color up in the sun. Um, so they really like to be outside kind of right out in the full sun. And wet, right? Yeah, they always like to stay, most of them like to stay constantly wet. Um, we suggest keeping them in a tray. We've got some big black trays if you've got more than one or if you've got like a garden. Uh, 
a bog garden, or just a few other plants, you can keep them all in some trays like this. Like this will just fit in there nicely. You can also do a deeper tray if you're having. If you're at, yeah, it's easier to water. They stay wet longer. Um, and so we suggest keeping them in trays like this. You don't want to go more than halfway up the pot with water, um, but that's just the easiest way to keep them moist, especially. Um, there's a few that like the tray to dry out, but they still like the soil to stay moist. So. So yeah, so we'll, we'll also, we'll talk about their specific soil blend or soil needs, which helps because it's a, um, an absorbent it, soil media. Yeah, it really replicates their natural growing conditions. Exactly. Um, and while we're on the topic of water really quick too, we can look at this guy again. Um, he has a few of those crunchy kind of looking pitchers at the top. They're a little deformed, they're a little crunchy looking. And that's what happens when the tray dries out for a little bit too long, and that's okay. Obviously, the plant is still alive. It's still doing well. Um, Making new pitchers that aren't, mm -hmm. you know, aren't affected. Yeah, it'll replace its pitchers, but it's just it's a little unsightly, and, and some of the nicer pitchers can go if it, this tray dries out. So it's not the end of the world if your tray dries out, um, but you really do, and you can just cut them off yep. like that. Snip mm -hmm. it down from the base. Because they're not of uh, use to the plant anymore, so. I've had this, uh, this is the second year that I've had this container, and I haven't repotted it. So... You know, not only has it kind of grown to the edges of its pot, which probably makes it harder for it to stay moist, doesn't have as much soil around the roots anymore. So really, um, ideally, this whole plant should be repotted because although it sits in a container of water, it all dried out in this extreme heat and I didn't do anything, you know, didn't water it soon enough. So. Well, and if you guys have snake plants, if anyone knows what a snake plant is, they will also push the edge of their pot and the pot will actually bend. Um, too. Yeah. It kind of gets to that point where it's really hard and um, they kind of bend out. So that's something to look for, like look at when you are thinking about repotting too, um, especially you're sourcing it. Yeah, we can kind of see that. I don't know if you can notice how it's, it's a little more ovular. Oval. Yeah, instead of a circle. So. <clears throat> where are we? Uh, oh gosh, let's talk about while we're talking about water, because again, as easy as it is to keep these things watered. Um, everybody has a learning curve. Mm -hmm. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> For sure, on learning this stuff. And um, I know that Patrick's learning began really when you were very young and your access was mostly internet, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So as most of us know when we look at things on the internet, especially when it comes to something so regionally specific like gardening, you're going to get advice and information from other areas of the country or even other parts of the world. Um, one of the things that originally Patrick was very cautious about and made us very cautious about, and we all kind of, as beginners, you know, we're trying to follow every advice to the T, was the purest rainwater, you know, or only distilled water to be given to these plants. Um, there was lots of things that you would read or hear about. Uh, high mineral content in, the content in the water and that uh, you had to be very careful with the type of water that you gave the carnivorous plants. And so I know that again, as a young guy, um, even without a job, he was trying to earn and use his allowance to buy distilled, or had his parents probably in many cases, <laughs> buying distilled water. Um, and even when we started carrying these plants at the garden center, um, only giving them distilled water and then one day you got a, what's it called? A TDS meter. A TDS meter. <laughs> they're like 10 bucks, so they're really easy, they're really cheap. Um, basically what it does, it'll check your solids in the water, like the minerals that are in your water. Um, it's like a little probe. It's a, yeah, right? it's a little probe, and it'll just tell you in um, a measurement called parts per million um, how much mineral content is in your water. And here in Oregon, we're blessed to have very clean water, um, very natural water. Um, and most of Oregon, unless you're on like a well or something, it's fine to water your plants without the still water. When Patrick first got his TDS mm -hmm. monitor, meter, oh, yeah. meter, he brought it everywhere. Like it's just pockets, you know, yeah, you it pack it around. Clip, you know? <laughs> I swear, everywhere he went, it seemed like he would test the water. So, you know, like tr I would trust this. Bull, re we bull, bull run, run. Mm -hmm. fine. Like a Swago water. Fine. Yeah. Uh, pretty much all, and you were out in Beaverton at yeah. that point in school, mm -hmm. so you checked a lot of water there. Yeah. I mean, I think also at the coast, the water is fine too. Tap. Um, you know. Yeah. yeah. So if you have like hard water, 
extra minerals in your water that turns your fingernails orange, you know. You can um, sometimes smell it too, the minerals in your water. Water softeners, if you have to use those, all of that is going to be hard on your carnivorous plants, in which case you should save your allowance and do distilled or collect rainwater, you know, as if we don't get enough rainwater here in Oregon. <laughs> so, um, but other than that, you don't necessarily need to worry about the purity of our already pure water. But that goes along with the fact that they're also very sensitive to other inputs, right? Yeah, um, like fertilizers and stuff, they really don't take fertilizer. There's a few carnivorous plants that some people will boiler feed them, like the sundews, they'll put like little osmocote pellets or something in the pitchers. And I mean, you can do that if you're, I would only do it if you're more experienced and you kind of are ready to an experiment, do an experiment. Um, but they don't need fertilizer to do well, obviously. There's been no fertilizer in that pot. Um, and it's doing Lots it's of great. high quality insect input. That's the fertilizer. Because mm -hmm. without bugs, if the, if the world were replete of insects, would we still have carnivorous plants? Pro I mean, maybe, yes, because they don't always need bugs to survive. Um, but it's just kind of like that extra fertilizer, that extra boost that makes them so beautiful and so full and growing so nice like that. Oh, yeah. Um, that. yeah. The little mosquito eater crane fly guy I was talking about. They naturally grow in really low uh, nutrient acidic soils in peat bogs, so peat moss, um, and there's very, there's no, there's very any, like to little to no nutrients in there. Um, and so that's why they have been able to catch these bugs. That's what they're doing. They're replacing the nitrogen that they don't have in their soil. They can't move. Mm -hmm. They were born in a crappy environment. Yep. By choice, kind of. Yeah. Or that's where they, they kinda, that's where there's well, less there's competition. Well, there's no one else there. So. Less competition. Less <laughs> competition. Yeah. So they've got to be sneaky and smart. So what is passing by when you're a plant rooted in the ground that might have a, a novel supply of nutrient like zinc, magnesium, nickel. Someone's buzzing back here. Ah, yeah. something else. You know, it's a fly or a dragonfly or an insect. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's why these carnivorous plants have adapted to catching and ingesting bugs as vitamins, but still able to photosynthesize like a regular green plant can. Yeah, and then we talked a little bit about soil, but we can move on to the more specifics of like the soil. A lot of our um, Venus fly traps, our hardy sundews, our tropical sundews, our pitcher plants, they're gonna want this mix. We kind of, we've got some bags of it back here, but um, Nicole's also gonna mix them up for us. Very easy soil mix is just half peat moss, half perlite, 50-50, depending on the quantity you're making, um, is what I use. And that works really well for me. It keeps the soil nice and fluffy, keeps it a little airy, but it also the peat moss is very um, moisture retentive, low in nutrients, like they like, um, and it's very, um, easy to make as well. But can we just use potting soil? You should not use potting soil <laughs> because usually a potting soil will get that extra additive uh, fertilizer or some other nutrients in there that they just aren't, the roots aren't able to handle it. Yeah. <laughs> so as Nicole's mixing that up here, we're gonna, um, it'll come dry like this if you buy it. We've, we sell both bags um, for that here. You can get it here. Um, it'll come dry. So as you're mixing it up, you're gonna want to have water in it and the first part as you mix it up the peat moss is actually going to be a little um, hydrophobic hydrophobic um, that's your word of the day uh, yeah don't uh, be hydrophobic today it's too hot <laughs> so it's not going to um, take the water right away so as you mix it in you can mix it around um, once we're done pouring this water and we're going to kind of really mix it up um, just to help the peat moss absorb that water because you don't want to pot a carnivorous plant dry because the peat moss can actually suck the moisture out of the plant. It's so, like floating on top. Yeah. That's hydrophobic. <laughs> I don't want to get wet. So we just kind of mix it in there just to kind of help it um, get wet and more mixed up. It's also easier usually to work with when it's wet. It's not as dusty. Um, with the perlite and the peat moss, they're both kind of dusty. So um, you can pour it in there and kind of let the dust clear for a second and then mix it with water and that'll keep the dust down for you. And give it a minute to kind of, like, it'll seem like it's absorbed, but after it sits for a minute, it'll have absorbed more water. Yeah. And there's a few substitutions that you can use, too. You can use, like, hummus. Um, it'll make the soil heavier. You can use some... Um, hummus? Hummus. Ah. Yeah. Hummus. <laughs> hummus to make the soil um, a little bit, it'll be heavier. Um, and then you can also use, use sometimes some washed sand instead. You can throw that in there, and that'll help. Butterworts really like the sand. 
um, mix. So, and then you can also use, um, some people use just straight um, long fiber sphagnum moss. Um, and that's just another, it's, it's just a moss, a dried moss that's harvested from a bog, um, kind of just like the peat moss. Um, but it's a specialty a, item. Yeah. A yeah. And they're, it's a little bit more expensive and it's you need some of the more um, harder plants to grow to appreciate that more. But for all of these plants that we have right here, this is perfectly fine. Um, Nicole's going to unpot this Saracenia for us. We're going to be able to look at its root system. Um, they usually have pretty extensive root systems. Um, I'm going to show you right here, this guy. He's got all these nice um, roots coming out right here, all these fresh roots. And you can see kind of here, there's the edge of one of the rhizomes. And this plant is big enough to divide if you wanted to divide it. Um, we're not going to divide it. Um, but it's something that as you get bigger plants, and if you want to, you give it to your friends or whatever you want to do, have more, put it, spread them out in different pots. Um, you can kind of almost just break the rhizomes in half, and that's kind of how you divide them. Speaking of dividing. Yeah, so this guy, I actually divided this uh, last year um, from another plant, and I planted two pots. So I have another pot like this at home. It's a little bit smaller, though. And this one really filled in. There's always a lot of little babies. They're kind of hard to see, but there's a few little baby, if you can see the little baby leaves in there. Uh, there's kind of one right there. Um, and the bigger plants kind of grow, and they grow new plants from the roots, and they also prolifically seed themselves, um, the sundews. They kind of, they're kind of the weeds of the carnivorous plant world. <laughs> You'll find them in a lot of your pots. Um, I mean, there's this little fern here too. It's kind of like another it's a little hitchhiker. Um, but the sundews, they like to grow a lot. They'll grow alongside sarracenia. They'll grow alongside any of your tropical plants. Um, they kind of just, as long as they're growing with other carnivorous plants, they'll do fine, really. Um, they'll see, the seeds will go, and they're kind of just everywhere. So that's always fun, too. You can either give them to people, or you can uh, divide them like I have for mine. And so this is a nice, really full pot. You know what? I'm going to go ahead and divide it. All right. It's not hard at all. So I've just, it's already wet, you know? So I just got in there, got my thumbs in between, and you can kind of see the natural, back up just a little bit, but you can see the natural clumping of it. And so if I just use a little bit of force, you can see, oh, it's so strong. I'm gonna pry these guys apart. It's best not to cut. It's better to just tear the plants so that they can kind of, um, the pieces can go with the sides that they're more willing to go along with. Ha ha, so two gorgeous clumps now that I could either still repot together. Oh, look at that nice bud of moss too. Oh, that's, yeah. that's a beauty. Patrick and I are both like, I'll take that moss. <laughs> so nice, two nice big clumps. Ideally, this isn't the best time to divide. This was already a stressed plant and it's, um, st it's stressful to have a division like this done, but I'll just give it a break. I'll keep it out of the hottest of the hot sun for the next little while. You can see like the biggest portion that was broken off is this little light piece here, but tons of healthy roots still on both sides, which is another way to kind of determine whether or not it's gonna be a successful, you know, if you have a successful division or not is a nice big healthy root clump. And yeah. so, one and um, what are we going to talk about next, or what we have not talked about? Well, we can talk about this lead we're pining this. We can talk about a few little companion plants really quick oh, too yes. that we've got. Um, so and your a, bog. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, so we can talk about. There's a few plants that um that we have or that you can get that will um grow well next to the carnivorous plants. So we were talking about that moss. On the and I were both like, oh, we'll take the moss. It's really it looks really attractive on the top of. Um, your pots is like a top dressing. Um, there's also this um, little uh, kind of grass that's called sweet flag um, that she has some growing in her pitcher plants right there. Um, but they do really well too if you're adding, if you're wanting to look for some more, there's kind of some in the front there. It just adds a little bit more texture into the pot, makes it more um, just kind of full at the bottom, you know. Um, and then on my cobra lilies right here too, um, there are some, there's some green stuff that kind of looks like moss right here. Um, but it's actually a mint, a Corsican mint, um, and that's a nice little ground cover that will kind of just crawl over the top and keep the soil down, which is nice here too because it rains a lot here, so it'll keep the soil kind of anchored, um, which is also a good thing about like moss and companion plants, um, is that they'll keep the soil anchored from washing away. Does it matter what kind of container really? 
Um, not necessarily. There's a few, like there's some obviously with like bigger plants we're gonna have bigger pots. Kind of like this sarsen here. It's got this nice big full pot. Um, and the cobra lilies I have in a white pot because they like the cool roots. So that just helps. It keeps it reflects the sun. That's really smart. Yeah. So that helps with that. I mean, but you can do anything you again want to make sure that it's able to keep water and if, with the, whether that's with a tray um, or in some other way. Um, there's some. Yeah, or cork, you can cork it sometimes. It's, you gotta be careful in the winter because we do get so much rain, you don't want it to overflow. Um, but that's another way to keep water in, in the summer. So here are the one that we just divided. I'm repotting the same two together into a bigger container. So just because we split them up, that's giving them more space to spread still and a slightly larger pot to grow in. Uh, but the division helps instead of just even repotting one big clump, you know? You can see, of course, my peat moss is dripping, but um, this one also, Patrick, shows. Yeah, look at this weirdo. This will lead us into one of the last topics. Yeah, we're going to, ironically, um, carnivorous plants, they do have a few pests, um, a few bugs that um, can cause them to be deformed um, or they have holes in them. This one is kind of deformed. He had something, maybe aphids at the beginning of the season. The aphids really go after that fresh, new, um, brand new, like soft, juicy growth because they like to suck all the nutrients out of the new growth. And once, the, I mean, you can- So like spring growth. Yeah, you see it later, kind of in the season, they're kind of deformed. So you just gotta look and make sure you, you can identify that. Um, and we'd be able to help you here too if you have any questions on pests. Um, I just let it happen, and that's what happens when you let it happen. Yeah, they get kind of wonky a little bit. It's a little forward, and he's got some little, he's got kind of like these um, little kind of ribs here that, have, that aren't really natural. They're just um, there. They also get slugs sometimes. Um, a lot of people have problems with slugs here. We just have a lot, and it's been a bad year this year. Um, but they will also eat the fresh new growth, but they kind of just munch on it. So you'll kind of get these holy pitchers, and there's pitchers with holes in them. So. They're not as attractive, and they might not as work as well. But they'll see, they're not they're they're gonna be okay. So um, that you can just fix with some slug bait around the pot of the plant. You wouldn't necessarily want to do it in the soil because again, it's slug bait is usually iron phosphate, and so it'll make the soil it'll add some nutrients in there. So just a little bit area around it is fine. Speaking of, oh, one of mine had um, some a chew out, a break out. Oh yeah. Mm. Well. So occasionally, and it happens more often with um, wasps. They've got their big mandibles. Yeah, mm -hmm. which, you know, they're big gnashing teeth. So wasps can sometimes get trapped, and as we mentioned, the especially the saracinias or the pitcher plants. And, it, and if, if you guys have handout uh, or questions, refer to the handout that we attach to the blog, which will give you both the common names and the botanical names of all of these. The pitcher plants or saracenias are exceptionally attractive to wasps and members of the wasp family. So they're great to have near your outdoor dining area or where you sit and read a book, you know, um, just because they may somewhat lure wasps to the area, but then they capture and attract them. So they're not gonna come over to you and your book and your iced tea. But the occasion when an extremely feisty wasp is captured and perhaps lands into a pitcher that has a high body pile or you know isn't full uh, or isn't you know going down to the bottom the wasp can chew its way out yeah there's a good so an insect can even attempt to chew their way out and fail um there have been you know like their head sticks out as the bug dies kind of thing that's kind of graphic but you can see a little hole in this one here where down towards the side where an insect has gotten inside and then tried to chew its way out but did not fully uh, succeed before it succumbed to the digestive fluids. So occasionally you'll see a little hole in the side, which again, you know, is probably going to then lead to further escapes uh, by other insects that get caught. But you could just then snap, you know, snip that tr uh, pitcher off um, and just prune it early. Yeah. But, you know, look inside and marvel at the success of the hunting that it did have beforehand. It's always a really cool experience. Yeah. And then real quick, I want to talk about to some of the ways you can put these together um, in different arrangements, kind of like that we have up here. Um, so this one is just mainly cobra lilies because they're a little special and they're harder to find. 
And so they, they're just all together like that in this nice pot with the companion plants. With the ground cover. Mm -hmm. uh, but like with this one here, this one's Nicole's um, personal one. She's got a fly trap and she's got a few sundews in there. I can see there's <laughs> a few little baby ones that have made their way into the pot. I see some Drosera capensis and some um, Tracy eye, and then the big one right Weeds, here. Weeds, basically. Yeah, the yeah. big one right there is Tracy eye. Um, and that Venus fly trap, and they will grow fine together, and they're outside all year, so those are the hardy ones. Um, and then also, I have at my house, um, well, I think we'll link a picture to it a little bit later. Um, I've got this big bog garden that I've dug into the ground, actually. And to keep it separated from the outside soil, I've got some pond liner in there. But about a few inches up, there's holes in the pond liner um, just to keep it draining in the wintertime. So it's got a reservoir at the bottom, but it's so it doesn't overflow in the wintertime. And it's pretty, I think it's probably three or four feet long by like two feet wide. Um, and it's just kind of a natural shape in my yard, um, and I've planted um, mostly sarsenia in there. Um, so there's a, I've kind of there's a few smaller ones like we don't have a good example of a plant, but we've got some pictures from this um, sarsenia purpurea. They're very short. They're kind of stubby and tubby. They're like this. They're about this tall, and they get kind of fat almost. Um, and they stay lower. So when you're planting these plants too, you can think about. Um, having some taller pitcher plants in the back, kind of with some medium foreground ones, and then having these shorter ones in the front too. Um, and you can kind of arrange things that way, just visually for pleasure, so. I think we nailed it. Yeah. And from uh, here, we just want to encourage you, of course, to not only uh, either stop in or shop online um, at the moment, the majority of the carnivorous plants that we have in our inventory are the Saracenia or pitcher plant variety. We will be restocking uh, Venus flytraps and sundews and butterworts as soon as they are available. Just right now, it's only the pitchers that are available. Um, check back. And of course, if anybody has questions, go ahead and put them in the comments and we'll answer them afterwards. Thanks so much for tuning in. Happy gardening.